Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter at The World covering global health. This is a live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic, vaccine acceptance, and public attitudes. And joining me is Jillian Steele Fisher, a senior research scientist at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Jillian, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for having me and welcome to all the folks who are joining this important conversation. Yeah, we are very excited to ask you lots of questions given, uh, let me just explain your role. You are a, a senior research scientist at Harvard School of Public Health and deputy director of the Harvard Opinion Research Program and the director of its global polling unit. So lots of insight on the ground in communities about what all is happening in people's attitudes around vaccines right now. Um, to everybody tuning in, you can post your questions for us on Facebook at forum HSPH, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. Uh, and this Q&A is jointly presented by the forum at Harvard School of Public Health, TH Chan School of Public Health, um, and the world from PRX and GBH. So to begin, Jillian, globally, it's pretty striking. Nearly half a billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered. And in the US, that includes something like one in eight people. Uh, more than a third of adults over 65 are now fully vaccinated. Pretty remarkable. But still, those numbers will need to be much higher to really prevent COVID spread and reach what many hope to be reached, something called herd immunity. So that's going to mean a combination of things like outreach, building confidence in vaccines, overcoming hesitancy. And you've been studying these public attitudes about COVID-19 vaccines. On the one hand, I imagine this is a really difficult thing to project because it's all new. Um, and the stakes of the pandemic change, things evolve, what we know about the virus. But I wanted to start off by asking if there's any kind of clear findings from your surveys when it comes to how willing people are to get vaccinated once it's turn it's once it's our turn. Yeah, no, I think um, this is a really great conversation to be having. And again, thanks to you and folks joining. Um, and I think you've started us off at this, at sort of the, the billion dollar question, right? So it's sort of like, if we build it, will they come, right? And um, I think uh, I wanna begin with some optimistic news, um, which is that we've seen, particularly in recent times, as the vaccine rollout really goes forward, that we see an increasing number of people who say they have either you know, gotten the vaccine, right, in line with that, but also the people who say they're definitely going to get it. And I pay a lot of attention to the people who say they're definitely going to get it, <laughs> as opposed to you know, people who might say, I probably will or maybe will, right? Um, that's an important predictor. Um, and we've also seen a pretty small and consistent fraction of people who say they're definitely not going to get it. Hmm. So that's a really small number and hopefully what that means is that we have an opportunity to kind of focus on the people who are in that middle category, the people who haven't decided yet. So in terms of kind of um, uh, making connections and um, communicating the, the challenges, what can we do with the folks who are in that questioning place? Now you say like, can we really predict it? Not exactly, but what we're looking at is a good number who say they probably will, and so there needs to be sort of encouragement to make sure that people have consistent information and can see so they can make a good choice for them and their families and their communities. It sounds like in that way, are you, even the way that you look at and frame vaccine mm -hmm. vaccinations and acceptance or confidence and hesitancy, it's, it sounds like what you're even saying and how you describe this phenomenon is a little more nuanced maybe than how we might think about it. Well, I think so because um, you know, it's not done till it's done, right? So one of the challenges of trying to, as you say, sort of predict is that we want to understand what people are saying today and try to think about, well, how is that likely to evolve? Because we know it's going to shift a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in some of the headlines that we've seen, there's this, you know, there's, there's a kind of an urge to keep defining like all the groups that are leaning positively, Right, and that number gets up toward the herd immunity level. I right? say, like, oh, we're seeing large fractions who are really want to get it. And I am more nuanced in it. I am more cautious. Uh, you know, <laughs> the frame of public health, which is like, hey, don't count those chickens till they're hatched. Right? We still have to do a good job. We still have to communicate effectively. Um, and what we do next is going to be really important for the people who aren't in the definitely camp yet. 
Um, okay. So then for those of us who are hesitant to get the vaccine or in that gray mm-hmm. area, mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the biggest concerns? Like, what are you learning from the, the polling that you're doing? Um, and I imagine that this may vary based on region, context, uh, race, history, globally and domestically. Yes. So, so yes to all of that. <laughs> um, it is certainly a nuanced issue, but I think for our discussion, there are a couple of key themes to keep in mind, right? So I think of it as there's sort of two big drivers around hesitancy that are important to think about. One is concern about safety of the vaccine, just kind of fundamentally the technical side of it. Is it safe? And people worry about side effects, both those that they've heard about And things that sort of just a general malaise, like I don't know exactly what to be worried about, but I'm worried about something. And then people are sometimes worried, like I could get COVID from the vaccine, right? There are these these worries about the safety. Um, And so for many folks who think like, okay, well then we can just explain. Like, we'll just give people the facts. Like you cannot get COVID from the COVID vaccine. Uh, The side effects are really rare. These may be true statements, but as we all are sort of increasingly aware, facts by themselves really don't, don't go the mile. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because of that second reason, because we're seeing such distrust in the institutions and the people who both developed the vaccine and people who talk about it. Mm. So there's limited trust in the pharmaceutical companies who made the vaccine. There is limited trust in Uh, media who talks about it. (laughs) There is limited trust in the agencies that regulate the safety. Um, And so, you know, the key element here, right, is if you want to tell people those facts, you have to get a trusted messenger, right? You have to get someone who can speak to people's concerns in a way that they will find um, uh, meaningful and trustworthy. I imagine that this is not the first bout that we've you've worked on when it comes to these trust issues. So have you found anything about who these trusted messengers are? And I also, based on some of the reporting that I've done, um, you know, the coronavirus pandemic has also um, in some ways around the globe, you know, broken people's trust in the way that health systems have really struggled to respond and support people um, and governments. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to acknowledge the fact that trust is sort of the critical issue, a critical thread that ties so many of the challenges together. Um, But I think I wanna speak to your question about, well, how do we build that, right? In this sea of distrust, where are the islands of trust that we can build from, right? That's kind of the the theme. And I think, you know, most of the work that I've been focusing on at the moment is in the US. Mm -hmm. And so consistently in the US, let's speak about that for a second, which is that, we see so frequently that physicians, doctors, people who are caring for patients really rise to the top when we're thinking about those who are most trustworthy on vaccines, um, those who are sort of generally viewed positively. It's actually not just vaccines when they rise to the top. Physicians are really seen as a trustworthy source across so many health issues that affect the public's health. Hmm. And to me, uh, it's going to be another magic too here, which is that Um, there's two sides of trust. And this, I will say, is not just a U.S. phenomenon. This is globally where we've, you know, research from um, really uh, remote regions of lots of countries and main cities in lots of countries and everywhere in between, we see that trust has these dual elements, right? So one is that people have to think that someone is trustworthy because they understand the sort of technical side of things. They are technically competent, right? They have the technical information to be correct. Um, And that, right, people in some ways kind of do okay on. But the other half of it is that you have to believe that person actually cares about you, Mm. that they have your back, that they're not trying to mislead you for whatever reason. Um, And so what's really great about doctors is they have kind of a magic ingredients, right? They have those, that technical understanding they understand you know, what side effects are, they've seen other vaccines, they know how this works, um, they've had lots of training, right? All those things. And every day they are caring for patients and those patients have a relationship with them, they trust them, they've, they've you know, seen their children, they've helped care for their parents um, and 
that experience um, and commitment is really visible. So they make really great spokespeople and they make really, and they are really important to bring into the conversation, even when we have mass vaccination sites, right? So this is a bit different than what we see in other vaccination scenarios where you go to your doctor's office, you'd have a chat, you get a vaccine, right? Now in this context, it's, it's different, right? You have to make that decision. You have to decide to drive or go or bike or whatever you're gonna do to get to that mass vaccination site. And there may not be a doctor there. You're not gonna chit chat once you get there, you have to decide beforehand. So how we bring physicians into that conversation is really important because we're, we don't have the benefit of that the way we do with other vaccines. I wanna bring this into a particular um, issue you know, in the United States, especially yeah. where black communities have been especially hit hard by mm -hmm. the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we're also seeing black Americans being vaccinated at dramatically lower rates than white Americans. So can you break down what is happening here and this intersection between the outreach and the access and the trust? Um, what are you finding? Yeah, you've raised a really important issue. And, you know, I think the pandemic has opened up uh, and exposed a lot of raw truths um, about inequities and uh, structural racism and active racism in the United States. And, um, I think, uh, you know, we have seen, as you say, you know, lower, lower rates of vaccination. Um, and I think it's important to think about understanding that as a responsibility to do better. Um, and uh, I think there's, there's two sides of it and they're interrelated, but it's, it's worthwhile to, to tease them out. One is on the hesitancy side. So um, what's, and I think that's actually somewhat misunderstood there's a lot of discussion about how uh, blacks are less le black adults are less likely to want to take the vaccine, but it's important that it's it's actually you said you know do I look at it with nuance and there is an important nuance here which is that um, it is true that uh, um, we see that black adults are less likely to say they definitely want to get the vaccine right away, but they're not more likely to say they're definitely not going to get it. What we're seeing is that more people in the more black adults than white adults are saying like, hey, maybe, I kind of just want to see what's going on here. And to me, that's actually quite a rational reaction, sort of at the community level, given the structural historical racism that the community has experienced from the medical enterprise broadly writ. Um, and I think it's important to realize that that's not just historical in the sense of in the past, it's historical, it's in the sense of embedded in the everyday current history of people and their lived experiences. And so when we are more and more aware of the ways that black communities and black individuals have been harmed by systems can understand like, hey, on the one hand, we have a perfect vaccine. We want to make sure that people who have been systematically um, um, more likely to have negative health outcomes and negative economic consequences from COVID have a better opportunity to get that vaccine. But I can understand when people say, hey, that's all good and well, but let me just make sure that is the vaccine, that that is what it is, right? We need to make sure that that's, that that's it, um, that this is a safe vaccine. And so I can understand that, but it's important to understand that it's not a commitment to saying no, that's an invitation for public health to do well and to invite people well. And I think what's hard is then we have the other side, which is the access. And right now we basically haven't invited people well yet. Mm. We need, we have some work to do. You know, I often say like, in order to be trustworthy, in order to be trusted, you have to be trustworthy, right? And so there are problems in terms of accessing the vaccine. And we see that in communities that, you know, because of a, a racism as well, you're less likely to have a mass vaccination site that's accessible to you. You may be uh, less likely to be able to take a break from a job or more nervous about asking your boss for time to, to you know, get the vaccine. All of these threads fit together. And so I think this is something we really have an obligation uh, and an opportunity, I hope, to address fully, understanding that they're related. Again, mm -hmm. what we do now is going to matter mm. because what we do is going to say, hey, are we trustworthy? Um, and and the piece that we need to then bring in is, okay, well, how do we begin to communicate the places we are? 
how do we connect to those communities? Mm -hmm. And I go back to physicians, right? They've got that two, the, the magic spice, right? Which is that they have these two ingredients. They are technically competent, they are trusted. And in particular, when you're talking about a that has mar been marginalized and underserved, you wanna make sure that you have physicians who reflect that community. We wanna to bring to the fore and make space for leadership by prominent, eminent black physicians, those who have great uh, clinical care, who have uh, important roles, who are important researchers as well, um, and maybe as associated with uh, historically bl uh, black colleges and, and universities. And those, those people are going to be trusted in, in a greater degree and going to be able to reflect the community's needs more effectively. And we need to make sure that they are part of the conversation effectively. And we have some work to do on all fronts. It's powerful to hear about kind of challenging assumptions that uh, policymakers might have or yeah. more broadly, and also kind of where um, the responsibility also lies in terms of establishing that trust and trustworthiness uh, in healthcare. Yeah. Um, I wanna to get to a question, a few questions are coming in. Um, I have several more myself. Um, this one is from Cassie and it's about the political, the politicization of yeah. the pandemic. Um, we see this in mask wearing, uh, business closures, whether the pandemic is even worth taking seriously. And this question is, do you see that polarization and attitudes toward vaccination? So it's an important question. And I think um, uh, use a Kathy for um, sending this in yeah. um, uh, because I think it's, uh, it's on a lot of people's minds. Um, and uh, we've seen that polarization occurs in so many facets of life. Um, and we've seen this reflected in the polling around um, uh, vaccines as well. Um, and so this is a, this is a challenge. Um, and I would say it's something that we, it, it's relatively new. You know, polarization is sort of taking over more and more parts of our lives and kind of bleeding into more and more parts of, of public health. And um, I think it's something that we really need to address clearly. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think the, the principles are, you know, that we see more distrust in the institutions, more worry that there's sort of political gain um, uh, um, from elected officials, and that that's sort of the justification of a vaccine rather than a real need. And we see it from folks who tend to vote more conservatively or more Republican. Um, and so the question comes back to, okay, again, in that sea of distrust, where are the islands? How do we connect to people? And that's another place where we actually need to build out and have um, physicians and other leaders who actually reflect those communities. So we need to have physicians from institutions that are in red leaning states that share those conservative values that are sort of the seeds that we can build from in terms of connecting to people because we don't want someone's political you know, uh, affiliation to determine whether or not they get a vaccine and, and that is gonna be life saving for them and protect it for their communities. So there is an obligation there as well to reach out to people um, through um, you know, physicians and, and other health leaders who can um, be connected and reflect that community and reflect their values and speak in a way that resonates with people about their own experiences, caring for patients like them. One of the things that you mentioned at the top of our discussion was about these kind of two elements of um, vaccine communication um, and confidence, if I'm framing this correctly. And one of it has to do with like safety and people's concerns around safety issues and vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about this current pandemic, there's just a lot of questions with it being a new virus. And now we have these new vaccines mm -hmm. with variants circulating um, and questions about how effectively the vaccines can address that. Um, and then when you get vaccines from really big, amazing, fast trials into the general population. And you go from like several thousand people vaccinated to tens of millions, hundreds of millions, um, rare events start to surface as well. You start to learn more and see things. Yeah. And so how do uh, you see this uncertainty in terms of presenting a challenge to vaccination efforts? And also what's the best way to communicate around unknowns and uncertainties, which exist without undermining the messages? Yeah, so uh, that's, the, that's the other, I guess the other billion dollar question, <laughs> right? Which is like, uh-oh, right? How, 
we know that we're in an environment where this is changing. We come into a pandemic, it's an emerging infectious disease. We don't know a lot about the disease. We don't, you know, we're starting out and kind of, you know, people often say we're kind of, you know, um, building the plane as we fly it, right? And, and that is the fundamental challenge. We still have to fly it well. And I think the key is that we have to be transparent about where there's unknowns, but not let that overwhelm the kind of central message of what we do know, right? And fall back on that because people do really need to hear the consistent and true message. And we can kind of, we can kind of lurch to the right or lurch to the left in communications in terms of, you know, kind of dialing, focusing too much on the rare events. Um, and when people hear about rare events often, it makes it sound like they're not rare events, mm -hmm. right? It makes it sound like they're common events because you're hearing about it commonly, but they're still rare. Um, and you can also lurch the other side where you sort of say like, okay, well, it's just, it's everything's perfect. And in fact, that also undermines trust because there are things that we don't know. There are side effects. And you have to be transparent about that so people can make an informed decision, um, but not let it get so rocked that you don't come back to the core, which is that for the vast majority of people, this is a very safe vaccine. This is very effective and explaining, you know, what the benefits are. This question comes from uh, Alexi. What seems to be the driving factors in people who change their mind on vaccination from a maybe to a definitively? Have you, has, have you learned anything from your polling about this That's or from your past polling? Yeah, I would say it's, it's um, sort of a broader lesson around, you know, how people, how people come to change their minds and, and keeping in mind that what we're talking about here is not going necessarily from, I definitely won't get it to I definitely will. I know that makes great headlines and there have been stories about that, but the reality is that that's, a, that's also a rare event, right? People mm. don't go from like deeply committed to the other side. It does happen, but that's, that's you know, not, again, a, a rare event. What happens is that people are not decided, right? And that's why, why I focus on that sort of probably will, probably won't group it's more people who are like, I don't think I'm going to. And then they kind of come in and they see what's happening. Do you and have I a think, sense of how big of a group that is? Well, we're seeing that it's consistent, right? So uh -huh. what we're seeing is that, um, you know, so uh, um, the people are sort of funneling down through the, toward toward definitely, right? So, or maybe funneling up. I'm not sure where's that, which way that metaphor should go, but they're funneling toward vaccination. There, There are fewer people in the, categories, which are, um, you know, the, the people who are, I'm never going to take it. That's sort of stable mm -hmm. a small fraction. Mm -hmm. And then all the other groups are moving toward getting vaccinated. There's fewer people in the probably not fewer people in the probably will more people in the definitely. And then there's a group in the vaccine. So it's moving. The sand is kind of moving through in that, in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what's happening is that, you know, initially, people kind of need to say, like, is this really, is this good, a good thing, right? What's it like in the real world? And as you say, how do we move from those trials to the real world? And in the real world, what does it look like? And so it's important that we have systems to update people. Hey, how's it going? And to tell the stories about how that is. And I think the, many of those stories have been really good, really positive. You know, we've had stories about what it's like for people when they get vaccinated, you know, and that, they, they have some piece of normal back in their lives and they, they are protected, right? Those are, that's amazing, right? This is sort of the si the, the scale of this development in the time is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. um, and so as people are kind of seeing that ground reality, I think that's actually what changes people's minds. I think that's why people are moving toward it. And I think what we need to understand is there's an underlying receptivity. And I see that not only in the US, but everywhere, right? As people are thinking about vaccine, that's why I always think about, hey, there's the definitely, and then there's a whole bunch of people where they're like, not totally, and that's that's where you need to really think and, and be thoughtful and be supportive so people can make good decisions. Speaking of real world, um, mm -hmm. this question is from Andrew. We've heard that people who are fully vaccinated should still be taking precautions, uh, social distancing, wearing masks in most situations, although the CDC has updated some guidelines on mm -hmm. that. Does this reality make it harder to like sell people on the vaccine uh, and the value of it? Uh, and do you see that changing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so let's go. So 
And much of what we've talked about today, right? We've talked about why people don't get the vaccine. And let's maybe kind of turn that conversation a little bit on its head and say like, well, why do people get the vaccine? Like, cause the decision is not just like, well, I don't have a problem with it. You also need to feel like, well, there's a reason for me to get it, right? And so why do people get it? And so there's a literal answer, right? People want to be protected. They don't want to get the disease. They don't want their friends and families to get the disease, right? But what they're looking for, right? is what we've had to give up in the pandemic. They're looking mm -hmm. for a piece of normal. They want to see a light at the end of the tunnel. We see this in, in questions where people say, you know, I want to feel comfortable. I want to return to these activities. Um, you know, and we've, the, the absence of social connections has been so painful and has had real consequences for people. Um, and so we want to get, we, we want to get the vaccine because we think if that's gonna be our ticket, right? That's, that's what's gonna get us there. And that has to be respected, I think, from the public health community, right? There's that, that's, that's the driving force. And so I think what this um, listener is suggesting is important, which is that sometimes the messages about, well, you're going to get the vaccine, which is all well and good, but actually nothing's going to change for you. Mm -hmm. Get the vaccine, wear a mask, social distance, stay home, you know, and you suddenly say like, well, wait a second, there's two problems. One is like, well, why should I bother, right? You have to wait in line for hours, potentially. You have to go out of your way. You have to come off of work. Like there's a there's something going on here that you have to want enough. Um, and, you know, it also is confusing because you say like, well, if the vaccine's so good, why do I have to do this? Right? And it's a complicated answer and nobody likes a complicated answer. You know, the answer is because, well, we can't be 100% sure and we don't understand this part yet. And we want to protect people in the, you know, at, at a broad level, we want to interrupt transmission. And those are still really important tools to do that. And so you have to be transparent about that. And you have to make sure that people don't get the vaccine and then say like, cast away everything. And I will, you know, you know, head, head into like mass groups of, you know, un, uh, you know other folks. But um, if you spend too much time on that message, it's confusing because you need to say like, hey, here's what you can get. And that's why I think these, these new guidelines from the CDC are particularly important and resonant because they do give people a chance, a vision of what they can do mm. safely, comfortably, without anxiety, right? Which I think we're all looking for less anxiety. So what's good about that, right? You want to be able to hug people that you love and hopefully you can be vaccinated, they can be vaccinated, um, you know, and, and make that connection. Like we, we've missed that. That's, mm -hmm. it's a long time. Um, and that's fundamental. This question's from Dominic on the world's Facebook page. Um, it's going back, uh, I think it builds on this, um, but Dominic's wondering, um, given it, it's that the far right political movement appears to be very skeptical of getting the vaccine, yeah. um, is what he says, uh, what, can, what can one do in brief encounters to help educate people or convince people that getting vaccinated is a good thing, um, for example, in public settings? Wow, in public settings. Okay. So I think that um, the one challenge is that there aren't a lot of public settings in some ways where the people are mixing, right? Where they don't mm -hmm. have a, a, a demonstration, you know, they don't, they don't wear their, you know, political affiliation on their sleeve. Although right. sometimes, sometimes, you know, people try to. Um, but I think that, um, you know, uh, in a way, this is, it's going to be a challenge for individuals to, to do that by public demonstration. And that really, this is a responsibility from the public health community. Um, and so I hope that people, you know, people as individuals, right, they may say, okay, well, I want to kind of create a norm around this. I want to make sure this is normal. This is okay. And for, you know, the sort of, you know, I, I, you know, I voted stickers, right. That I got vaccinated, um, part of it, sort of creating a norm and showing actually that I got vaccinated, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. like I, it worked out well for me, right? Those stories mean something to people, but there's there's a lot of, you know, distrust uh, between individuals in those contexts. So, you know, it may be challenging. And so that is then incumbent upon the public health community to say like, how can we bridge that? How can we make those connections? And to depoliticize wherever we can um, some of that information. And I think... <laughs> Ironically, by to depoliticize it, it means that you have to have people from both sides of the aisles. And by people, I mean physicians, right? I'm going to go back to that to say, hey, you should 
you know, this, this is, this is what I think. This is safe. I've taken the vaccine. I've seen people who've taken it. They're safe. This is why I'm recommending it to my patients. I've seen the hardship of COVID. This is why it is. But there's a human resonance and that sense of compassion. Because I think, you know, from, from both sides, hearing it from political leaders, that's hard. They, you know, we talked about physicians having the secret ingredients. Political leaders have almost neither, right? <laughs> they have not necessarily the technical competence and people aren't sure whether or not they have their, you know, good intents. And so moving it away from that part of the conversation, I think is, is actually the answer. I wanted to say this question towards the end of our conversation, um, just because I didn't want it leading it, but um, I do want to ask about the case of AstraZeneca yeah. um, from a global view. Um, there's been a kind of a public relations mess with it in Europe in particular, a lot of countries halted the vaccine programs, resumed them um, in part because of some concerns over some ver very rare medical events as uh, monitoring agencies try to figure out if there's a link, proven link or not. And uh, for example, the European Medicine Agency found no proven link, same with the WHO. There was a US trial that just wrapped up the first one of the big phases in the US last week where it hasn't been approved yet, but now there's some conflicting results or confusion ar around the preliminary um, results of the data. Um, and so I wanted to for gauge, what is your reaction to something like this happening? Um, does that concern you in terms of the work that goes into building um, a, a desire to get vaccinated what is, what is your, what is, how are you observing this based on the polling that you've done and your reaction? Yeah, it's a, it's, um, it's an important issue that you raise. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's important to remember that at the moment, right, so AstraZeneca is not the vaccine that's in the United States, right? So there's, there's a little bit of like, oh, what to watch for from the U.S. perspective. Um, and it's not currently. So there's, I think there's a lot um, to be said for communicating about the current vaccines and their safety profiles, their e efficacy. Um, uh, in that regard. But I also think there's a broader lesson that we have to learn, which is that this is not the first time that we're gonna, you know, it's another first time this kind of thing has happened, right? Where we have new information um, that, you know, even if it turns out to be a false alarm. And I think what happens is that sometimes we kind of miss the mark on the messaging, which is that, you know, uh, as best we can tell right now, right? If this is a false alarm, we should be glad that we have an alarm system, right? So it's that we're actually doing due diligence. We're actually making sure from the public health side, right? That these vaccines don't just kind of go out and we don't know what, what's happened to them. We follow up and we make sure that they're as effective in the community as they were in the trial. And so trying to communicate that is really hard. Um, and it, we, you know, well, I, I don't know what I wanna say it's so hard is we sometimes don't say it that way. Mm -hmm. Right. We sort of say like, oh, people don't know. And there's this uncertainty. It's like, well, actually, this is an expected part of the system. And we haven't like prepared people for the fact that this is what's, you know, this is the system. This is what's going to happen. And so we have to, you know, reflect on the fact that if this is a step um, and this is what what happens, that it's then framed appropriately. And if it's a positive thing, which is that, hey, we did a good check and actually this vaccine is good to go, then we we need to kind of um, communicate that and, and consistently as, as a key message so that we have an opportunity to build trust in the infrastructure and not just see this. Cause this is, this, this happens, right? And we want it to happen. <laughs> That's why we put the checks in place. Um, and so um, it, this is something that we're gonna come up again um, that we'll need to keep an eye on. Even with, in referencing, for example, this, the um, release about efficacy data and then US uh, uh, monitoring or scientists saying, hey, like, we're not sure about this data yet. Uh, it needs to be updated and more comprehensive. Do you see that as affecting people's confidence? Or I know that by me even asking this question probably raises this alarm of like, is this raising people's questions? But, um, you know, what are the lessons in that, in this kind of space? We, we have to be transparent about it. You have to actually put it out there because people, you know, part of what makes people nervous, right, is they feel like the system is too glib, it's too, it's too fast, it's too slick, right? So you have to have the reality that it's not, fa you know, fast and glib. I mean, it's, it's been, you know, efficient, but 
where, where it builds on it. You don't, you don't want to have that, that sense. And you don't want to have a sense that you're kind of covering up, right? That's, that's no good. <laughs> you have to be transparent, but it has to be presented in the right light, which is that like, hey, we're being really careful about this. Hey, we've got this check and this is what we found. This is part of our protection system for you. That's a bit of a nuanced message. It's a harder message in that sense, mm -hmm. but it needs to be there. And I think if positioned in the right way, it doesn't have to be totally undermining. I think what's undermining is when those things are said without context, they're said repeatedly, and there's not, you know, there's not an understanding of, of the broader system in which um, why this came to light, right? It's because we have a really robust safety check system. It's because, you know, we're really making sure that it's safe. Um, and, and that kind of needs, needs to be the message. Um, I just want to get to, if, it, if there's enough time, just like one other question that's coming from listeners um, that uh, I, I hadn't thought about. Um, this is about, uh, um, from an online question, do you have a sense about people, people's faith, for example, in the U.S. public health institutions, uh, whether it's, it's recovering uh, after a year of not so great pandemic management? Because I imagine with polling that this might also intersect with trust and trust, for example, in vaccinations. Yeah. So um, I actually think there's a real opportunity here to build trust in the public health enterprise. Um, so... Uh, you know, I personally have been doing work on outbreaks and pandemics for a long time. And up till last year, no one knew what I was talking about when I said the word pandemic. Friends were like, what's, what's that, right? And, um, you know, and now, right, we've had this um, really kind of, you know, life-changing, um, uh, you know, point, an inflection point. Um, and so um, there have been some missteps in places. Um, but it's also been a chance to actually address this and to do it right. And what I'm hoping is that particularly, no, no pressure on the vaccine rollout folks, but hey, guess what? Um, you know, this rollout actually has an opportunity to do a better job, to, um, to show kind of what's great about public health, right? To show kind of the way that um, research and science intersects actually benefit people and that there can be management, and there's gonna be small missteps along the way. There, there has to be, it's not gonna be perfect. But if we can show the sort of overall good and being communicated, I think that's actually a really powerful opportunity. Um, so if we are going to, you know, this is a chance for us to be trustworthy, I guess is where, where it comes down to, right? And that way we can actually communicate that. Um, and we have to address the inequities. We have to do that well, we have to, um, make sure that the systems are in place so that people who want to get the vaccine can get it and that people are encouraged by what they see around them um, and that it is safe and effective going forward. And that is a real chance um, that we don't often see. And what I hope is that if we can do it well, then that actually protects us for the next time where people don't say like, I don't want people to say like, well, hey, what's a pandemic again? <laughs> they won't in the near future, but whatever the issue is, right? it's always really hard to kind of sell the prevention side of public health. And, you know, if there's any silver lining um, to, to this, it's like, well, can we, can we do better now so we can be better for the future? Mm. I think that's a really good note to end on. Is there anything that you wanted to add about the lessons that you've learned? Well, I think that, I think that maybe sort of building on what I just said, which is that there really is an opportunity here, right? So if we, the lessons that I think can help us do a good job, right? So we have to substantively address rollout equity. We have to we have to do a good job. There's no getting around that. There's no bumper sticker. There's no campaign. There's no slogan that's going to solve that. That's that's substantive. But then we have to do a good job communicating that. And so the lessons to me are, hey, we need to build in the sea of distrust. We need physicians to be part of that. We need someone that they trust. We have someone they trust. We have to make sure that we take, uh, bring those folks into the communication fold because mass vaccination sites by themselves are not gonna, not gonna do it. Um, and on the other side, we need to make clear the benefits of vaccination that we don't undersell the opportunity here um, and that we give people a motivation and a reason to do this so they can see and then so they can actually experience the benefits of being protected. Well, thank you. I think that's a good place to, to conclude and wrap up and for answering um, viewers' questions, my questions. Uh, so thank you for fielding all of our questions, Jillian.
Thank you so much for having me and giving me the chance to talk about this. Um, I hope uh, listeners have um, something to think about and something to take home um, and appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. So um, that concludes our discussion. And this Q&A is jointly presented by the forum uh, from Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the world from PRX and GBH. You can view this full discussion on our Facebook page and send feedback at forum HSPH and at PRI the world. And join us again uh, next week on March 30th at noon Eastern when we'll be discussing COVID-19 and global health with a focus on what's happening in Brazil and Latin America.